some students said that they were a little confused as to why JMU did not mandate that students get tested before they got to the university. So what was that decision um, necessarily about? Why weren't students required to test before they came back to campus? Could you just explain to us um, the process that it took for JMU to open back for students to come to campus? We have first principles that have guided our decision making throughout the pandemic. And that's really important to understand that we've talked all along about the importance of maintaining public health. And that's an absolutely top priority for all of us, but also maintaining academic progress for our students. Back in March, when we first faced the pandemic and its full impact on campus, when we had to make a quick pivot to online learning, those decisions were guided by maintaining public health, but also making sure that we could continue to be open as a university in the sense of continuing to provide those educational services and programs for our students. And we learned a lot uh, since March and having that experience. Uh, we certainly learned new and better ways in terms of providing education online and our faculty have learned a lot more including over the summer but we also saw some challenges in going through all of that for example we learned about the real digital divide and some of the equity issues that have come up during the pandemic when students are on campus we know that they have access to the internet and technology and different support services and when everybody suddenly had to go home we couldn't assume, as we learned, that everybody had stable internet access or a quiet room to study and to participate in classes. And so those were things that we had to take into account as we approached this fall. And so it was really our goal to try to do both of those things, to maintain public health, but also to maintain academic progress on campus as much as possible for all of our, our students. We made a lot of investments uh, over the summer to make the campus safer and to prepare for the new educational realities that we're facing with personal protective equipment, uh, technology. We invested a lot in technology for our classrooms and with our faculty, uh, cleaning supplies and equipment of all kinds. You've probably seen hand sanitizer stations all around campus. Even things like the robots that are delivering food around campus to people that are not able to go. Uh, and of course, we did a lot of messaging, as I know you have seen as a student, the Stop the Spread campaign. We've used all the different communication channels that we have here at the university to try to send that message. We created agreements for students and student organizations to talk about expectations and accountability during the pandemic. But all along, as we made that decision about should we try to reopen and have uh, on-campus presence of students and on-campus classes, we knew that we would have to maintain flexibility and adaptability. And those were, were really the watchwords for all of us throughout the summer and as, as we approached this fall. Some students said that they were a little confused as to why JMU did not mandate that students get tested before they got to the university. So what was that decision um, necessarily about? Why weren't students required to test before they came back to campus? That's, that's a question that's, that's created a lot of confusion uh, nationally, uh, certainly. Um, first of all, you probably know or you may have heard that CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, as well as the Virginia Department of Health strongly recommended against colleges doing that kind of mass screening. And there are a couple of reasons for that. First of all, uh, doing all of those tests in advance does not guarantee that you're gonna stop the spread of the illness. Because first of all, you could get tested on a Tuesday afternoon and five minutes later, uh, you could go someplace and you could get the illness or you could start uh, to develop those symptoms. So uh, there's a, a lag time obviously between if people are coming to you from off campus to the time they arrive on campus when the test result might not even be valid. But more importantly, the, the health experts at CDC and the VDH said, that kind of mass testing is going to put a tremendous strain on the system. It will require uh, taking resources away from people that really need it. It will take more time for the labs to process those results. And what that means is the people that most need tests that are symptomatic 
or that have been identified as close contacts might not be able to get the tests in time and that there might not be a timely turnaround in analyzing the results. And so they strongly advised against doing that. I want to shift the gears uh, a little bit in regards to how the university may be helping um, the Harrisonburg community. And one of the things that I've learned from uh, my band director from the Marching Royal Dukes, Mr. Rickers, is that uh, being a student within the marching band, it, it means more than just playing an instrument. It means more than just coming to practice. There's a contribution that I have as a member of the JMU community um, and being able to give back to the Harrisonburg community as a whole. So what is JMU's responsibility during this time um, in relation to helping the Harrisonburg community? That's a, a, a great and important question because as you may know, community engagement is one of the centerpieces of JMU's identity. We are important partners in the community with the city of Harrisonburg, with Rockingham County, and all of the people who live around us. And so we recognize that we have an important responsibility to the community and, and have done so throughout this pandemic and that we've got to coordinate closely and work closely together through these incredible challenges that we all face. So we, we've been working, first of all, uh, to very closely with public safety officials in the city and the county to talk about, you know, what information do we need to share with one another and, and what inaccurate information might be out there that we need to uh, correct or to make sure that, that people have accurate information about what's happening. An example of that uh, is that there were rumors locally that students were filling up the local hospital after they came back. Well, that abs absolutely was false. Uh, of all the different cases we've had, only a very, very small number have sought any treatment uh, at the hospital. So that's an example where we've worked very closely on communications and information sharing. Uh, and as I mentioned, of course, we also coordinate very closely with the regional office as we've been directed of the Virginia Department of Health to track the spread and to share that information with the city and the county. I was on a call, for example, a few days ago with public safety officials and with the mayor of Harrisonburg, and we talked about our approaches and what we needed to do to help each other, uh, including with the message of how to stop the spread and making sure that everybody in the community knew what they needed to do to do their part. The, the other thing I would say, Xavier, you, know, you mentioned um, you know, being involved uh, with the community in various ways, and certainly the Marching Royal Dukes do a lot of great community service. We have been helping the community throughout the pandemic because we've recognized that we as a university have a role as an anchor for the local economy and providing a lot of resources and services to the community around us. So for example, uh, as we went through the early stages of, of the pandemic, our faculty, staff, and students were helping small businesses and entrepreneurs to figure out ways to safely reopen uh, or to keep their businesses going. We were sharing and manufacturing personal protective equipment, even hand sanitizer with help from the chemistry department. We worked with the farmer's market. We had faculty and students help them figure out a way to go online uh, and to allow those farmers to continue to, to sell their goods safely. We had our literacy efforts with things like the Gus bus that we took virtual in our community. So there were a lot of things that we decided to try to do to take advantage of technology and all the things that we had learned, the innovations that we've developed to help our community through this, this incredibly challenging time as well. Those efforts are certainly gonna continue and we are meeting and talking regularly uh, with our community partners to make sure that communications are clear, that information is shared and that we can think about ways to help each other through this. Thank you.